Am I dressed all right? Yeah, of course you are. Look, look at the state of me, James. Well, I thought I'd wear something really sort of formal, you know, which isn't too formal. Yeah, this is why I, I'm going to be standing behind <laughs> the camera. <laughs> so, so do you do you? So, what's your current kind of position as far as bony invasion is concerned? Do you still are you, are you still going to stand by direct inspection of the periosteum, so periosteal uh, bone? Or are there kind of is, are there different perspectives, or, or how, do you think there are other ways that we can assess whether there's bony invasion? Um, I, I mean, there's better imaging all the time yeah. coming up. There's, we've now got comb beam CT and. And I think that will continue to progress, and yeah. we have to keep an eye on that. Right. But, but if you think about when you're cutting in the soft tissue, yeah, you know, you very interestingly showed me about this new cyber knife or eye yeah. knife, yeah, which, which which may well work in bone as well. We don't yeah. know. Yeah, maybe. But in my life as a surgeon, I guessed. Yeah. I felt the tumour was here, mm -hmm. and I assessed its edge yeah. when it stopped, and I took a centimetre or a centimetre and a half or two, depending on what I could do yeah. and what I was trying to protect. So um, it, it's pragmatic yeah. surgery. Yeah. It's not You don't follow a rule exactly. Yes. But, but I still stripped periosteal right to the last jaw I took out okay. um, for a segment. Yeah. And, uh, well, or especially for a lot of rim resections, yeah. partial resections of jaw, are done for margin yes. safety rather than because you think the the tumor is invaded. So there's only a few of those that are actually where you're worried that they're invaded. Right. Uh, but the trouble with periosteal stripping around attached gingiva is it's very inaccurate. Yeah. So you have to be able to strip it easily off the bone to be able to see. But I would still, if I'm up the ramus of the jaw, I would still strip the periosteum back. I would wait until I saw the tumor going into the bone, right. and then I take my margin. Right. Just like. In the soft tissue, I see the tumour in soft tissue, and I yeah. take my margin. Yeah. And so I don't think that's any different. Yeah. I'm. I. I. I hope that my colleagues have done that because yeah. I showed in my in my work. Yeah. That it was the most accurate of all yeah. the techniques of a, of of assessing whether there was invasion. Yes. And and also quite accurate in extent. Yes. So what you saw was what it was. Yeah. And, and so that then, I guess, give, gave you the appetite for, for surgical, clinical, relevant research. And what, one of the, yes. sec, well, the second biggest thing that you're, you're, you're well known for uh, on, a, on a worldwide arena is the mid-phase classification mm -hmm. um, in ablation. And, and how, how did that kind of whole journey from beginning to suddenly realising you had a tool that was both clinically relevant and simple, usable, how did that whole journey come about? Well... It really started because, because as an SHO, I used to do the obturators yeah. um, for the patients as a maxillofacial. And um, when I was a senior registrar in, in Birmingham, um, at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, there was a, some ENT surgeons did quite a lot of maxillectomies yeah. and just obturated. And some of them were very difficult to, obtur to obturate. Mm -hmm. And I sort of thought, mm, um, maybe we can do better than this. Yeah. Um, but so I started doing some mid-phase work, and, and that and that was really a fluke, I think. Mm -hmm. in, in a sense, um, Aliak Crest and um, putting Aliak Crest into other bits, another story. But but basically, from my interest in the mid-phase, um, it frustrates me that we don't we didn't have a, a decent classification, and then and there was um, Peter Guadero who came up with quite a good one around the same time as I did, mm -hmm. and McGregor again, Ian McGregor. Had, had a class one, two, three, which are very similar. But I thought, well, actually, we should, you know, make this um, um, more fundamental and also include the dental element. Yeah. So because of my dental training, I wanted to include the extent of the, across the way, so bilateral or, mm -hmm. or if you, and, and I thought that was missing. Yeah. And so what you either had, you either had a, a you either, either had a decent vertical classification or a decent horizontal uh, classification, but they weren't combined. Right. So I tried to combine that, right. and that was why I suppose I got involved. And then the opportunity for the Lancet, for the Lancet classification to, to publish in Lancet Oncology, mm -hmm. was because the Lancet Oncology asked me yeah. to do a systematic review right. of mid-phase reconstruction. And then I thought, well, I know what I'm going to do. I'm, go I'm going to introduce a classification in this publication. Yeah. That, 
that that added quite a lot to the paper, and is what people remember about the paper. Yeah, and um, and so that's how part okay. of that came around. So a lot of what comes around is is actually because you just see a potential need, yes, and then you start working at it, and either that becomes you become more convinced of that. And you carry on with it, yeah. or you become less convinced, and maybe it falls by the wayside. Yes. Yeah. Well, you're over it. So this, and so I, you, you've touched upon it already, and that brings me to my third question. And the third question is about the DCIA, and, and that's a flap that yeah. that you and Liverpool have popularised in midface reconstruction, but a, a, you with a, with a particular element that was added. Um, what was the thinking behind using the DCIA for midface, and, and how did you adapt that with the internal oblique? Um, well, basically, the Ali Crest was always known. It was a flap that people were using. It was a German guy, Reidegger, I think his name, and um, David Vaughan, who was my senior colleague when I was appointed here in Liverpool, um, did the occasional Ali Crest, but he did it Taylor's technique, which is to go down onto the Ali and then follow back. And I watched him do one, and he is a really good surgeon. Yeah. or was, he's now retired, but, and he struggled a lot. And I thought, hmm, if he's struggling, mm -hmm. I'm going to find that very difficult. And I couldn't really see how he did the operation, necessarily. And then it was pure chance that I came across Erkin's 1989 paper, which was 20 cases of mandibular reconstruction with internal oblique. Mm -hmm. But he described in detail how he raised it with internal oblique. And so I thought, well, that might, that might be a way of doing it that, might, that seems logical to me. So in those days, of course, you would go and do a, a, cada a cadaveric dissection. Mm -hmm. And I did each hip, this technique yeah. from, from, and think about, Mar I'm a great supporter of Mark Kirkin because mm -hmm. he wrote so well. Yeah. And when he explained something, he explained it very well. And um, it worked. I, I did these two hips on yeah. this 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 uh, cadaver, cadaver and then the next week David Vaughan had a mid-face case mm -hmm. and for some reason I just thought well I think this flat might work in the mid-face yeah. especially if the muscle um, can withstand the radiotherapy yeah. that inevitably these patients get with extensive um, maxillary resections mm -hmm. and um, so so that's what I did so he said oh well I'm doing this maxillectomy and it was quite a big maxillectomy yeah um, I would say a class three from the classification that I wrote and 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 you know it went really well that operation and the the the, the complexity of the, the short pedicle and uh, using because we weren't doing a leg dissection we had options there mm -hmm. I mean it all seemed to work out okay and perhaps I had a bit of luck or whatever but I'd done a lot of free flaps by then yeah I was quite um, I had mm -hmm. my feet under the table and and it was it was impressive how it worked, and then we just and then from there on we 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 started doing more cases, and um, the iliac crest internal oblique um, I like because the crest is the iliac crest is such a good piece of bone mm -hmm. it doesn't require so much osteotomy. Um, I always found fibula um, a small piece of bone that required a lot of osteotomizing yeah. that didn't have a brilliant blood supply. And I had a lot of good results with Alia Crest, personally. And, and I thought the donor site was very well tolerated because of the way I raised it. I raised it from the abdominal side mm -hmm. so that the, the, um, the ASIS, the anterior superiorial spine, mm -hmm. didn't get damaged, so that the uh, inguinal ligament didn't get uh, disrupted, yeah. so that they had a pretty decent result at the end of it. And a lot of, and we, we published, um, Simon Rogers published a paper comparing our fibulas and, and iliacs uh, donor sites and they were I reckon our, our iliacs came out better so in that sense um, that's why I'm still I still feel that the flap has a real role yeah and um, and you know the, the skill of being able to use it and raise it and, yeah. and the mixture of muscle and bone of very high quality <laughs> um, I think is impressive and so prior to that adaptation and the just using the muscle to long in the oral cavity was that a, a, a flap that was used well in the specialty because I'm assuming that, that was a big leap to convince people yeah. like Mr. Vaughan to yeah. just line the oral cavity with muscle as yeah. opposed to skin. Yeah, well, again, 
in the oral cavity, the pleural mouth tongue, mm -hmm. I think that it that it's still not used very commonly, mm -hmm. and I I don't blame people for mm -hmm. that. Um, I think there's good alternatives, yeah. um, but in the palate, it's perfect mm -hmm. because it it binds and it it it, it contracts yeah. and it, 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 it you could all, I had patients that wear full dentures without anything else. No implants or anything, yeah. and um, that's phenomenal. There's no other flap that can do that. Mm -hmm. In the so in the palate, it comes into its own. Yeah. In the floor of the mouth, it's still very good. So you can still cover quite large areas, and if you haven't got too much tongue resection, mm -hmm. you can get away with it and get a good result. And of course, it looks perfect. Yeah. It doesn't look like skin, and for the patient, so in the right case, it's also valuable. So, so Liverpool. It is one of the leading UK centres for both um, uh, surgical perspectives. Yeah. Um, in fact, I think I would I would suggest that probably almost every pre FRCS maxillofacial higher surgical training will have watched the Liverpool videos. Oh yes. Yeah. Uh, and um, the but but how how did Liverpool manage to combine both the the research side and also the surgical and training perspectives? So well, and, uh, and and become such a big unit, not only nationwide but worldwide. You you were there in that whole kind of development of the unit. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the initial um, impetus was Olga Pospisil, of course, who who persuaded David Bourne to come to Liverpool um, all those years ago, 1982, 81, 82, and and he gave up his head and neck practice in order to persuade him to come. And they divided up the private practice a little bit as well. And there was a kind of a deal made between the two of them to sub-specialize within the specialty. So that to create a deformity surgeon and a head and neck surgeon. And they were the first people to do that formally. And um, when I came to Liverpool, what David Vaughan offered me was a head and neck practice, fundamentally. He was going to try and make me do some orthognathic surgery and some deformity work, but that fell by the wayside very soon because I didn't have the operating time. And so by concentrating on one area in the specialty, you're able then to have more time to read about what you're doing, to understand it better, to go to meetings and courses where it is so you could go to a lot more head and neck courses um, and conferences and you could start to get an understanding of what people were into. And of course, one of the reasons I came to Liverpool was because of the big, because it was the biggest head and neck uh, clinical practice for any maxillofacial unit in the country that David Vaughan had set up himself. And so when I came that first year, I did 45 uh, free tissue transfers. Um, and, you know, I don't think I've ever done so many, mm. and and the, the, there was there was so much work to do. So, Alderpus Basile and David Vaughan had, had shown the specialty the way to go. I was the second head and neck surgeon to be appointed mm. in maxillofacial surgery in the UK. David Vaughan was the first, and and in the same unit. So that was eleven years apart, mm. ten years apart or so. Ninety two was when I started. So, but at, at the at the beginning of your consultant career, certainly to have that kind of ambition and, and that uh, interest in both research yeah. and academia, and be a, a, a surgeon performing free tissue transfer yeah. was probably a rare breed back yeah. in those days. But with a succession of good appointments, um, yeah. Liverpool has now developed into the biggest unit. So my question to you is: surgeon first, academic first. Or both? Um, well, it's very interesting because the reason I came to Liverpool was because I knew that David Vaughan wasn't particularly interested in research and I knew that I could take over the, the clinical side of the research and of course um, that's what I wanted to do. Um, and in a sense that's, that's what we needed to do at the time. I think um, um, for me it's all research. You know, and it's very interesting now that I'm no longer doing head and neck surgery, I look back on my career and the only things that matter to me are the papers I wrote yeah. in that sense. That the contributions I made that may have increased understanding or maybe introduced a new technique or a new way of using a technique. Um, but really it's, a, it's about increasing our understanding. That's what good scientists do. Mm -hmm. they, they look at data and they, they understand it and they, and they explain it. And then we get that advantage ourselves and then hopefully 
somebody else can spring on from that. So I think research and the desire to know more and to understand better and to be able to provide a quicker, more reliable operation for the patient or to be able to diminish that operation and make it just successful are all important things. If you look at breast surgery and breast cancer surgery, it's amazing mm -hmm. how, they, how quickly they've been able to diminish the surgery, sometimes diminish radiotherapy, but at the same time increase chemo and increase other areas that really work. So for me, ev the evidence base is absolutely fundamental. And, um, and you know, as a, as a young surgeon, I would say to a young surgeon, you know, you don't take anybody's word for it. Nullius in verbe is the Royal Society motto. Mm -hmm. You know, don't take anybody's word for it. You know, find out yourself and see if the boss is right. Yeah. And see if what we should be doing is what the boss is doing. Or maybe maybe we should set some way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. Like your work recently you are showing me about getting a better margin. Yeah. Or getting a more confident margin when you're operating. Um, and doing and, and so getting a better result for the patient. Sure. And, and sort of looking looking into into the future now, we we have a, a new generation of uh, of maxillofacial yeah. trainees, and, and they have very different hurdles and barriers to the ones that we faced uh, at the early stages of uh, of our careers. Where, where do you think the specialty is? Uh, if you reflect back on the past and, and on the present. And what do you think it has to hold for the future? Yeah, well, What's your perspectives on maxillofacial head and neck surgery? Yeah, well, that's a very political question. And, um, you know, like I was saying to you, my, 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 my friend and colleague Richard Shaw said to me, you're not very good at politics, and I said, I take that as a compliment. And, and perhaps I'm not, you know, perhaps I'm not the person to ask that. I certainly what the future is. Um, but what I would say is, is, is we must recruit, and we must have a a specialty that people really want to do and for me it's a fantastic specialty because it's the face and the mouth and there's so much sensation there there's so many things that we have to do there's so much function that we need to restore and you've got to be interested in that and and, and mm -hmm. we still cut and mm -hmm. we still um, there's a there's a lot of skill there mm -hmm. and it's it's a pleasure to be part of that and so I think we've got a fantastic specialty I think that the problem is we have to be dual qualified at a time when education's ex getting more expensive, people are running up bills like we didn't have to, mm -hmm. or when I did my medicine degree, all I had to do was um, just pay a few exam fees, which were, uh, you know, uh, some money at that time, but, but I didn't, at least I didn't have to pay fees of 9,000 a year like yeah. they do now. Yeah. And I think that keeps a lot of people out of it, and I think we've got to be very careful about whether we need dual qualification. I think we will always have dentists that want to be maxillofacial surgeons and we will always have dual qualified uh, yeah. people and I think that's vital because dentistry does bring another dimension to yeah. your understanding. Yeah. There's no doubt about that and, I, and I, in a way I support my colleagues who want the degree to remain mm -hmm. and around the world lots of surgeons want it to remain but at what cost mm -hmm. and you've got to look at I think that we should allow single qualified, medically trained surgeons to get into our specialty mm -hmm. and to be part of our team, mm -hmm. certainly. And when I, because we have such a good relationship with the NT, you know, I just don't see any difference between them and us, really. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. what we, what an ENT surgeon will do is, okay, that that could be a dental cause, right? I'll ask my colleagues. Mm -hmm. You know, and like yeah. we say, I think that that larynx, I'm not sure about mm -hmm. that appearance. I better get one of my experienced uh, ENT specialists to have a look down with an AZ endoscope, see what they think. Okay. And so that you build the team around the patient and the patient gets the best of every world and we become less tribal about protecting what we have in mm -hmm. a sense and being more expansive. Yeah. You yeah. Know. I'm going to throw in a, a little question that I, that I yeah. haven't prepared uh, for you. I, I don't know whether it's an urban myth, um, but when, when David sought our first first Gally. popularized the, the radio forum freed yes. up and then of course Vaughan published the bigger series on yeah. that were, were you around when all of that was going on and, and how, how was how was that all received and that interaction i was unaware of um of that rivalry at that time mm -hmm. obviously everyone knew sutar and i was privileged to hear sutar's address in new york when he was asked to give the keynote on his life and it was fascinating 
Um, Sutar is definitely a very bright, clever guy, mm -hmm. um, and Vaughan had to follow, and um, he probably regrets that all his life, but that's the reality yeah. in that sense. But I didn't see that fight, but I did hear about Vaughan all the time. I was in, in Birmingham as a senior registrar, and I heard about this guy that would, that would, um, you know, he would do a radio forearm flap mm -hmm. and finish by two o'clock, <coughs> and then he'd do a parotid on the rest of his list, you know, and finish by five. Yeah. And he had a phenomenal reputation, and I think very much he he was a general surgeon registrar before he went back into the specialty. Mm -hmm. And I think he was pretty pretty highly trained as a surgeon because in those days you got a tremendous amount of, of hands-on compared to a trainee now. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you couldn't even do that in the modern era. So he brought to our specialty this phenomenal mm -hmm. skill base. So he established that, that if you like, that habit yeah. Of, and we, we would take on surgeries that other people wouldn't take on mm -hmm. because we, we, we had the confidence yeah. and the skills and the training and everything else. Final question. Surgical training. Um, what do you think about where we are with surgical training? Do you, do you think training is, again, a political question? Yeah. Do you think it's adequate? Do you think we need to do more? What can we do better? And what are we doing really well at? Well, it's difficult for me to answer that, but it's too long. Mm -hmm. That's number one. I think the technicalities of surgery can be taught quite quickly and a good surgeon will learn fast. And we need to be better at picking the best and, mm -hmm. and we're outward thinking yeah. in the way that we train. More wider, more research, definitely. Yeah. So much more emphasis on that. And so that we bring in surgeons who are always thinking, questioning mm -hmm. and wanting to do work that might change the future as well as spending less time just filling hours and years in so that they can tick it and say I've done my two years mm. well you know and, and so I think it should be far more far more structured far more um, directed focused well, I, I, I'm gonna thank you uh, Professor James Brown for your time and your evening um, probably for me one of the most influential figures in maxillofacial head and neck um, surgery uh, it's been a pleasure, and thank you very much uh, for a, a, a very interesting uh, evening. Thank you. Well, thanks, Jags, and good luck to you. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. That's it. You're done. Okay. How was that? Well, I like. Right. Okay. I've never seen that. <laughs>